You're listening to the ESO Network, your station for all things geek. Howdy, music lovers. Welcome to Modern Musicology. My name is Alan, and with me is Rob and Anthony. How are you boys doing tonight? We're good. How are you? Well, I'm great. Anthony, how are you? Well, Rob said we're good, so I assumed he was speaking for me. But yeah. uh, yes, I was speaking I'm well, for both me you. and Rob Levy. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell does that mean? <laughs> Oh my gosh, that's hilarious. Alan, he's cloning himself. Oh no. We've got to get out of here. I'm only going to refer to myself to as the third person for the rest of this podcast. He will be doing his own four host podcast pretty soon. (laughs) God. No. All right. So this week we are talking about great final albums. Every band or artist eventually has a final album. Maybe they retire from the business or they pass away or they just lose interest in recording. Whatever the case is, every career comes to an end at some point. But this week, we're going to talk about the great final albums, bands or artists who ended their careers on a high note, a particularly stellar album. So before we jump into that, though, we've got a little bit of listener feedback to get to. So, uh, Anthony, why don't you kick us off with that? This is all coming from our opening bands episode, and we got a lot of feedback on that. So take it away. All right. So we will start with Jim Cardillo. Or Cardillo. Let me know how you pronounce it, Jim. What's a great topic. Modern English opening for the Ramones was crazy. Bottles flying everywhere. They played I Melt With You twice in an attempt to keep the crowd at bay. <laughs> wow, that sounds uh, it sounds wild. It sounds fun. <laughs> yeah. We also had Doug Worthington write into us uh, with some that I've witnessed, odd pairings, and some disastrous off the top of my head. Mahavishnu with Harry Chapin opening. Harry was received well. King Crimson in 73-74 with openers Jojo Gunn. Didn't go well. And Golden Earring booed off the stage after a horrific bass solo. <laughs> wow. God, I mean, if you're opening for King Crimson, you have to be good, right? Yeah. Otherwise, you are going to get booed off stage. Oh, yeah, totally. All right. Uh, Doug carries on. National Health opening for a comic Chris Rush. Half the place emptied after National Health. Hmm. REM opening for Gang of Four. REM didn't go over well. I don't think they had a deal yet. It was Gang of Four's first tour here. All right. Well, I mean, I still think R.E.M. are kind of terrible. So (laughs) on the same bill, Flash, which is apparently a yes spinoff, Dust, a heavy Brooklyn trio, Brewer and Shipley, David Bromberg, in that order. It was a free WNEW show in Prospect Park. Everyone was great. Cool. Uh, Thank you, Doug. Those are some interesting shows. Absolutely. All right, Rob, who you got? Andrew Egan chimed in. Billy Squire opened for Queen. He was excellent live. And then we got a small encyclopedia entry from Robin <laughs> uh, Robin Rossman. Thank you. I love opening bands. Be Your Own Pet opened for the Ravenettes and just blew the joint out. Best punk band of the early 21st century and a shame they broke up just as they were beginning to get mainstream notice. Hooch bands have been great too. I saw Battle Hooch opening for either the Meat Puppets or Black Mountain and bought all three of their CDs. Both the Meat Puppets and Black Mountain shows were so good. I saw Moon Hooch, alto sax, bass, sax, drums, doing stuff. I can barely comprehend. Opened for They Might Be Giants. Got their CD too. I saw Grace and Tony open twice and loved them. Yes, I bought their CD. Oh, the Juliet Dagger opened for Shonen Knife. Leave Me Alone is still a favorite song of mine. I've seen both Crocus and Wendy O open for Motorhead. Wow. Uh, The Wendy O one was a Christmas show at the Ritz. The Blow opening for, I'm not sure who, I was really there to see The Blow, and my friend got sick before the headliner, so we didn't stick around. That was performance art with a side projector projecting whiteness onto a screen, 
as she gave her talk and it would click through to whiteness every time she said next slide it was genius wow. they played a single song at the very end of course invaders from sears opening for sonic youth will be an all-time favorite because i was playing drums very very badly that night i can go on and on and on and on brocus wow I like a lineup of Juliet Dagger and Shonen Knife. That's brilliant. Yeah. I bet that was a great show. And then we got one more from uh, my friend Elaine Sweatman. And she says, I have a few. It seems I have a habit of seeing opening bands right before they hit it big. I saw the Bengals open for Cindy Lauper in 1984. To be honest, I didn't know who the Bengals were at the time. It was a few years later when I rediscovered them and fell in love. I saw the Jonas Brothers open for Jesse McCartney in 2005. That would definitely not be the case these days. It would be the <laughs> exact reverse. I saw Lady Gaga open for New Kids on the Block in 2008. As for an artist that I learned about from their opening set that I now love, Curtis Harding opening for Lenny Kravitz. Curtis is great, and I've seen him on a solo tour since then. As for Lenny, he opened for Aerosmith back in 2005. That was wild. All right. Thank you all for writing in and sharing some of your opening band experiences with us. I love hearing people's concert stories. I just absolutely love it. All right. Now we shall jump into our main topic, which is great final albums. So Rob, why don't you lead us off? You were the one that picked this topic. So why don't you tell us what you were thinking when you, when this came to you and tell us one of your first picks. I came up with the topic just by trying to think of things we didn't do. There wasn't really any um, thought in it. It was just like random thought wave that came through. Um, but upon, you know, hindsight, it actually kind of is a cool, <laughs> cool subject. Um, so I guess I'll start with the obvious one. Um, and that's Joy Division's 1980 record, Closer. Uh, Ian Curtis died in March of 1980. They released that record in uh, May. <laughs> they didn't wait too long and it it's their second album it's a shame he didn't live because it's it's really astounding everything from decades to 24 hours and some of the other stuff on it it's really really 40 years on still pretty bleak but it's a fantastic album uh it doesn't show any signs of wear probably for a while uh at least in the sort of you know alternative oeuvre of music it was kind of like the end all beat all of final albums to get to like Oasis and some other people coming along. But yeah, I mean, not necessarily the most wonderful situations to have a final album. And it's one that you can still play and listen to today, um, especially at picnics. <laughs> at picnics. I love how you were like, I'm going to go with the most obvious one. And then you don't pick the Beatles or whatever. It's well, cause joy I thought there, division. Were, there were ones that I knew you guys were going to do. So no, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that you introduced it as the obvious one. Well, I meant for me. I should have said the obvious one for me. Oh, okay. I got you. Sorry. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to start with what's probably an obvious one for me. Uh, anyone who knows me kind of knows what I like. And I tend to like a lot of prog and I like a lot of metal. I don't think a lot of people would pick this one, however. And that's Genesis with Calling All Stations. I, I think it's an often overlooked album. It's the one with the one-off singer, Ray Wilson. Phil Collins isn't on it. And yet it's surprisingly strong. They go more of in an alt-rock direction. And there are some very, very proggy moments. So you've got the obvious radio hit in Congo, right? That was the one that was the single. It's got a very, very cheesy synth solo. But once you get past that, you've got some great tracks on there. The title track, amazing, moody, atmospheric. The dividing line is the epic prog piece. And overall, it's just a surprisingly solid album that a lot of people just don't think about because they think about the Phil Collins or the Peter Gabriel era. But candidly, I'd rather they went out on Calling All Stations than on We Can't Dance. Oh, isn't that the truth? And you know, we've talked about this before, so I think you and most listeners know that I love this album also. I think it's a I think it's so much better than the last couple of things they did with Phil. And as you say, the, the title track, I absolutely love solid album. Alien afternoon is, is a great tune. Dividing line. Fantastic. So yeah, I'm all with you on this one. Just a great album. So I, I guess I could do one. <laughs> yeah. You Why should. not? So I'm going to go with the obvious one, even though it's not, 
maybe exactly obvious because I'm going to go with the Beatles. But what do you consider their last album? The last complete album that they recorded or the last one that got released? So that would be either Abbey Road or Let It Be. Abbey Road was the last complete album they recorded, and that was in 69. They had started Let It Be before that, but they didn't, they did like some recording afterward in like early 70 to finish that album. And in that amount of time, Abbey Road was released first and then Let It Be afterwards. So Let It Be was the last released one. But as the last final complete recorded album, by the Beatles, I am going to go with Abbey Road. And as great as Let It Be mm -hmm. is, I honestly think that Abbey Road is a true masterpiece. First of all, you get songwriting credits from all four of the members, and that's not always the case. Anytime you have a Ringo song, it's a lot of times written by uh, John and Paul. And in this case, okay, yes, it's Octopus's Garden, but it's a song that Ringo wrote for him. And I, I like it. It's not a great Beatles song, but I mean, it's fun and it suits his personality. And, you know, but then you get George Harrison who comes in hot with the two greatest songs he ever wrote. And that's something. And here comes the sun. And I've said a billion times that I think here comes the sun is one of the greatest pop rock songs ever written. So already mm -hmm. you've got this great influx of material from the quote unquote lesser members. Mm -hmm. But then when you get to the rest of the album, you've got come together and Oh Darling, which is a great like blues rock kind of thing that Paul just shreds his voice on. And it's amazing. I want you slash she's so heavy, which is a couple of John songs that are kind of mishmashed together. And as they go through, switching back and forth between the two, the time signatures change. And, you know, it's just a fun, long song for Beatles. It's like seven and a half minutes. And that's, they, they didn't get into that range very often. You have Because, which is a three-part harmony with the three lead singers. And the band considered that to be the hardest vocals they ever recorded. And then on side two, you have this long 16-minute suite of songs, which is first of all, just a great achievement as far as like recording goes, but then the ending bits, Golden Slumbers, Carry That Weight, and The End is so good. It's probably one of the best things that the Beatles ever recorded. And The End features Ringo's only recorded drum solo. It features the other three trading lead guitar licks back and forth in the outro, and it's just phenomenal. So from a songwriting, from a performance, from a production standpoint, Abbey Road, I think is probably the greatest final album ever released. I think it's strong. I mean, it's definitely got three of my favorite Beatles tracks in Come Together, uh, I Want You, She's So Heavy, mm. and Here Comes the Sun. I adore all three of those tracks and have since I was a kid. I mean, they're just yeah. outstanding. Yes. Yeah, and Here Comes the Sun is, I, I, I don't need to repeat, but it's a masterpiece. And the great thing about that record is probably next to Sgt. Pepper, it's the one that still feels contemporary, that doesn't feel like it's dated, mm. which I think is really huge. I played this for someone a couple of weeks ago who was much younger, of a younger generation, and they didn't know it was the Beatles and asked if this was a band Jack White produced. And that got me, wow. that got me thinking of this would be what a Beatles record produced by Jack White would sound like. That's interesting. Yeah. You know, I was looking at it on uh, Spotify today because I was kind of revisiting some of the tracks that I love and I was, most of them are in the like double digit millions. There's a few of the tracks on the album that are like in the three digit millions, like, you know, two or 300 millions. Here comes the sun is over a billion plays on Spotify. That makes me so happy <laughs> being a big George fan as I am. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love that. The best, best ending album ever. I guess since I have spent the better part of the last month repeatedly watching stop making sense. Oh yeah. Um, like somebody that's just obsessed with like a painting or something. Um, Talking heads, last record blind. It's interesting because it is a much better record now than it was when it came out it's one of those records but like nothing but flowers is amazing that's my favorite talking head song it's my it's in my top five talking heads uh, songs but i just love it mm -hmm. um and it's got some really cool stuff on it too and you know the other interesting thing is you've got you know 
they brought in some some extra people to help produce it, and it's sort of got its own feel to it. Johnny Mars on it uh, from the Smiths. It's it's just kind of like they wanted to make a record that was completely different than how they'd been making records. There were a band that was clearly tired of doing that, but I think it was sort of too little too late. It sort of, I think the personalities at that point had really started to strain. Burn was doing some other stuff and they still had Tom Tom Club hanging around. Jerry Harrison obviously could do some other stuff. So I think each of them was feeling the tug of kind of doing their own thing, even though they did all sort of bring their own songs to the record. It doesn't sound as fluid as previous Talking Hands records, but when you go back to it, it's still fantastic. Like I remember when we played Nothing But Flowers at the college station I was at and it was like, this, this was many people's introduction to Talking Heads. And it was like, it just was really melodic. It was kind of like, it was light, but it wasn't too light. And it still had some really amazing uh, drumming from Chris France in it. And um, yeah, the whole record is, is, is better than you think it is, but it does not have a flow. It's kind of disjointed a little bit. And that's, that's its undoing. Yeah. No, I agree with you. I think if, you know, if you're the Talking Heads, you ended your career on a, on a very strong note. Yeah. I mean, it might not be the equal of some of their earlier ones, but I think it's still great. I love it. The one I'm picking next, you could argue it's a final album in two ways. You could also argue it's not a final album, Uh-oh. which is Heaven and Hell with The Devil You Know, which for me as a band, technically Heaven and Hell was the continuation of the Dio era of Black Sabbath. So you could say Black Sabbath came in and recorded 13 later, so it's not the final Black Sabbath album. <laughs> Whatever, 13 sucked, get over it. (laughs) However, it was the only album released under the name Heaven and Hell, and it will be the only ever studio album released under that name. And it was also the final album recorded by Ronnie James Dio before he died. While he had his own solo band, I mean, you know, you, you can look at this in several ways, but it was so good. You know, there was just something so special about Dio, Iommi, Butler, and Vinny. Mm-hmm. that just works so well and that entire album from atom and evil through bible black through breaking into heaven just recaptures that kind of magic you'd seen on albums like dehumanizer and the original heaven and hell album yeah just oh dio's voice is just such a perfect match with iomi's guitar i agree with that they i mean i think black sabbath was always great but then when you paired those two up on heaven and hell it that, it was just next level and it's interesting you know when you look at this album as a final dio recording particularly since you come off of the dio solo career with magica which i think was a really good album a, a, a strong concept album i don't think it's as good though it's not and i think the problem with dio is you look at his solo career and magica wasn't anywhere near the heights of the solo career it was certainly no last in line it was certainly no holy diver yeah whereas i think the devil you know stands up with the other three albums that black sabbath recorded with dio mm-hmm. yeah i agree with you on that one next i'm gonna do this is like my second favorite final album ever and it's a great story behind it and that is the great great david bowie and black star He had been off the scene for quite a while and had a 10 year retirement, basically, after he had a a heart scare and came back with an album called The Next Day, which was a huge surprise because no one knew that he had recorded it. He basically did that same trick again in 2016 with Black Star. The first thing that came out was a little piece of the title track, which was used as the theme song for a BBC show called The Last Panthers. And that was your first taste of new Bowie music in quite a while. And it sounded really good. I was so excited to hear more of whatever this was that he had had recorded. And then Black Star, new album, came out on his birthday, 2016, January 8. And it was a phenomenal album. It was so full of life. It's so different. It, nothing else in the Bowie catalog sounds like it at all. And it's got, like, the title track is a 10-minute song, and it's just an epic, incredible... It's actually, this is interesting. It's 9 minutes and 57 seconds. And it was originally 
like four or five seconds longer, but iTunes won't release a single that's over 10 minutes. So they shaved like five or six seconds off of it to get it to 957, which I think is just interesting. But the title track, Lazarus, there's a song called Girl Loves Me, which is filled with all kinds of like slang and circus patter and things like that. And it's a fascinating song. Dollar Days, I Can't Give Everything Away. The interesting thing about it, though, is that what you don't realize is that he is basically on his deathbed. Two days after the album comes out, he drops dead. I mean, just amazing. And then you go through this album and you find all these clues in all these songs about he is expecting the end at any moment. And it's just a horribly tragic album and it's so gut-wrenching to listen to it with that new context i don't know that we would have picked up on the clues had he died a year later i think that when you have songs like some of the lyrics in dollar days and lazarus like there's a line in girl loves me where it says where the fuck did monday go he died on sunday i mean you, you can't predict that kind of thing, but it just adds to that level of mystery around that album is just intense to me. So plus it's just a great album. He could have gone out knowing that he was really wrapping up everything in his career, his life, everything. He could have gone out on a hugely commercial album that he knew people would love and it would sustain his reputation for the rest of time but instead he goes for this weird avant-garde jazz inspired amalgam of an album and it's just bizarre and i think that's the most brilliant thing he could have possibly done and i think that's the thing bowie was always very much an artist so oh, yeah. he went out with a piece of art and i remember alan the first time you and i went to see the bowie tribute band jerome newton the band that fell to earth yep over in Avondale Estates in Georgia. And they played Lazarus as one of the later tracks in the set list. I don't think there was a dry eye in the house by the end of that. I think yeah. we were all crying. That was just an amazing experience. And that was that show that they did. They label it from Brixton to Blackstar and they take a set list of songs and they play it in chronological order. So Lazarus is basically the last thing that you hear. It's the wrap up of the show. It's the wrap up of his career. It's the yep. wrap up of his life. Holy smokes. What a, just a gut punch of a song. And then they came on and did five years as the encore. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> it is a record of a man in complete control of his career, of his ending, of his narrative, everything. Yeah. You listen to it. It is absolutely, I think you use the word heart wrenching, but it's, it's just like, I heard it and I'm like, okay, there's something going on. Nobody, there was some obvious theme or there was some backstory of why, but we didn't really know. When they sent out the digital, because the, the promos were digital for that, at least for, for us, and we didn't get it till 12.01 on release date. They did not drop that early to anybody. 12.01 mm. is when the, the, the little download th thing came. Yeah. Wow. And then uh, press announcement to come. And the next press announcement that we got was the one that everybody else got. Um, but I'm curious to see what the press announcement was supposed to be. But yeah. the whole, the thing is, it's like, it is just, even at the end, he's like, I'm going to change directions and give everybody what they don't expect. Even at the end. And I'm, mm -hmm. it's just, every time I think about black star, it's just, I shake my head because it's just like, it's astounding that it's even out into the world. And then the fact that it's out into the world and it is so prolific as it is. It's just an immense piece of work. Yeah. And I, I think there's an aggression to it. I think it's defiant. You know, I think that there is so much life in it. That's what just blows me away about it. Since, you know, we're on this road of cheer and awesomeness, let's go with Amy Winehouse back to black. Again, sort of the yang to David Bowie's yin. And that it's an artist that had so much potential, the ability to make like a huge impact and be prolific and it all got squandered away and wasted and were left with, you know, an empty bag, basically. Amy Whitehouse had more talent in her finger than like a bunch of people today. She didn't need a vocoder, didn't need a lot of production stuff, just a naturally amazing 
voice, but in in the in the parlance of uh, a fellow music critic friend of mine, she just couldn't get her shit together. And just if someone would have gotten her straightened out and would have like gotten more out of it, it'd be amazing. But if you're gonna go, that's a great record to go out on, right? I know with Bowie, you talked about going out on a huge commercial record that seals your legacy. That's exactly what Amy Winehouse did. You know, she did have some really great production from Ronson on it, but at the end of the day, it's still her voice. So it's, it's, it's a terrible last record in terms of like what happened to her. But if you got to go, that's like Bowie. That's a, that's a a way Mm -hmm. to go. What I think is so wild about that album is it was released almost five years before she died. Right. I mean, I think that says a lot about how off the rails her life went. Yeah. But I honestly didn't realize it was her last album until Rob brought it up because I thought, well, she she must have done something else in that time. No, she didn't. Stop, start, stop, start. Couldn't get in a production route. Couldn't get in a studio and get it done. I mean, Sinead O'Connor reached out to her like, can I help you? I mean, all these people were trying to help her and nothing happened. It's just horrible. And I mean, you know, her career is basically two albums, but they're two really phenomenal albums. And when you go from Frank in 2003 to back in black, I'm sorry, back to black in 2006, that's a huge jump stylistically and artistically. And then to not be able to get your shit together to do anything more beyond that. It's so tragic. I'm going to be a little controversial again. It's me, of course. I can't imagine that. So many would not consider this a final album because this band has done something like 18 albums and this is technically only album number four. But (laughs) they have come back and said they kind of wish they'd changed their name after this album. And that is Marillion with Clutching at Straws, which was the final album they did with Fish. And of course, after that, Steve Hogarth came in and they carried on with Season's End. But fundamentally, this is the end of a certain sound that they had. It's the end of an era with a vocalist. And this album, to me, is one that is just their crowning achievement. So many people would say the previous album, Misplaced Childhood. I prefer Clutching at Straws. It is a wonderful examination of the dangers of fame. Starting out with hotel hobbies, warm, wet circles, running right the way through to the last straw and happy ending. It's really a song to drink an entire bottle of uh, Johnny Walker to cry multiple times as you get there at just the emotion. There are songs about broken homes. Sugar Mice is all about failure as a father and daddy taking a rain check. Slange Navarre, I mean, that really is the bo- bottom of the whiskey bottle. White Russian is doesn't quite fit. It's the only one that's kind of about a communist regime and not about the pitfalls of fame but you know there's got to be an odd one out but it's a great track and that warm wet circles that time of the night that little double set just gets me every time lump in the throat just the sheer emotion that fish puts across in this album it just sends shivers down my spine it is outstanding i'm a big fan of incommunicado really yeah I love okay. that track. Interesting. I always felt like the odd, like the true odd one out stylistically because mm-hmm. it's very kind of high energy and mm-hmm. with widdly keyboards. But yes, yeah, it's, it definitely is. It's definitely the odd one. It doesn't quite fit. I mean, it's a good track, but it doesn't quite fit the uh, the sound of the album to me. I will say that I first heard that song in isolation from of the album because I heard it on that sampler. I think. Oh uh, yeah, I know. So the then, when I came yeah. to the album, that was the first, the only one that I knew from it. And yes, everything else does sound very, very different from it. But that one, yeah. I didn't have the context when I first heard it. Everything else is very melancholic. Yeah, and that's very upbeat. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> but such a good album, and I consider it to be a final album. Uh, the name carries on, but it's a different band that comes back with Seasons End. All right, Alan, over to you. Okay. Well, I guess since we're sort of in the prog vein with Marillion, I'm going to go, I'm stay proggy and I'm going to go with an album that wasn't, I don't think it was intended to be a final album. It just sort of worked out that way. And that is Rush with Clockwork Angels. And 
I was a huge Rush fan from early on, uh, 2112, which was 76. It was the first one. It wasn't the first Rush album that I heard, but it's the first one that really sort of like so all consuming, you know, but they sort of stayed proggy. They got a little prog pop in the eighties. And then in the nineties, they sort of, I don't know, kind of went grungy. Not that they were actually ever grunge, but they dropped a lot of the prog influences and they dropped all their keyboard use, basically. And they just were a very different band. All the songs were four, four to five minutes long. There were no big changes of time signatures or anything like that. And it just didn't feel like it just felt like any old rock band that just happened to be called Rush. And there was a lot of stuff in that time that I liked but I never really liked any particular album all the way through the way that I did in the seventies and the eighties. So when clockwork angels came out in 2012, Oh my God, that was such a huge, it wasn't really a return to form so much because you know, this is rush. They had a lot of different forms, but for me, it was the closest that they came to sort of grabbing that prog glory that they had in the seventies and eighties where they have this, it's a concept album and it tells this complete story from start to finish. Unlike things like hemispheres and 2112 and those things where it's like a suite of songs is the concept and the rest of the album is isolated tracks. This is one complete work from start to finish. And it goes back to more long form. I mean, they don't have any 20 minute suites the way they did in previous years like Fountain of Lamb Neth or anything like that, but they have six and seven and eight minute songs on this album. And there's lots of change in texture and change in style and change in time signatures and stuff like that. And it just felt like Rush again. And it was so exciting. Neil Peart was the, the lyricist for the band. And I think it's one of his greatest achievements. And I feel like Getty and Alex match that musically. I think that they really, really came up with an absolute masterpiece. I think it's one of the greatest Rush albums ever. And it was the last thing they ever did. They did a tour for this album and then they did a tour for their 40th anniversary. And that was it. That was the end of the Rush story. And that is so sad. And I listened to this album often enough and it still sounds so fresh and new in my mind that it blows me away when I stop and think, this was 11 years ago. <laughs> it just does not seem like it was that long ago. So that is mine, man. Clockwork Angels, one of the best Rush albums ever. So September the 28th of 1987 is an interesting day because on that day, there's like five or six different records that came out. The Pixies released Trompe Le Monde and Depeche Mode released Music for the Masses and the Smiths, Strange Ways, Here We Come, all got released on the same day which is pretty amazing if you look back upon it now that all these records came back. But I want to talk about Strange Ways a little bit. They, the Smiths recorded Strange Ways, Here We Come. Johnny Marr was kind of like, I want to do something different. I want to get away from this jangle kind of stuff. Let's do something different. Morrissey didn't want to, and uh, Johnny Marr left, and that's the end of the Smiths. The fact that we've had no output from the Smiths as, as a group since then pretty much means that uh, outside of the clash, you're not really going to see, you know, one of these bands back. Like, it's done. They really went out on a high note because you've got these typically bizarre, jangly, great pop records like Girlfriend in a Coma and Stop Me If You Think You've Heard This One Before. But then you've got Death of a Disco Dancer. And then Last Night I Dreamt That Somebody Loved Me, these like epic, long songs that were kind of rooted a little bit. Uh, Johnny Marr says he, he had sort of, the idea for them to sort of have their version of Prague and that it was just how long they were, how much they dragged out and where they went and they were doing some things with synths on these records. It's an interesting way to go out. You went out on a high note and um, that was it. They, they made the album. They, they only got back together to do two B-sides and then they were done. And it's their most critically acclaimed best-selling record that they made. Still today, people are listening to it and, and love it. For anyone that uh, hasn't been totally put off by the antics of one former member of that band well that is the uh, elephant in the room right i mean for me hearing that section of mike joyce andy rourke and johnny marr alone makes that a great band the thing is people always say oh morris no the smiths what made the smiths so great was that band i mean that unit yeah. behind him 
Mars a genius. You know, Andy Rourke was fantastic on bass. And Mike Joyce is, he's not a great drummer. He's not a bad drummer, but he's a really solid drummer who understood how to play with the people he played with. He did this later in the Buzzcocks. He worked around the framework he was given. And, you know, the fact that they made those records and those harmonies is what, what, what I remember about the Smiths records more than the lyrics is I just remember the harmonies and what they did with that. And for me, it's, you know, that and the first two Morrissey singles, and then I'm mostly out, right? <laughs> I'm pretty sure Girlfriend in a Coma is the first Smith song I ever heard. Really? Yeah. And it was thanks to MTV. And I think my local radio played it some and I really liked it. And I never really got into the Smiths after that, but I'm starting to now, like I've talked about a, a few episodes back, I'm starting to invest in the cure and the Smiths because I think it's really stupid that I never got into either one of those bands and I'm missing a big chunk of my musical pop knowledge by not being into those bands. So I'm fixing that. Good for you. Thank Alan. you. Good for <laughs> you. I should do the same, but I'm allergic to Morrissey. <laughs> You well, should be. You're right. <laughs> All right. Next up is I know is, is one that I think Alan and I are going to disagree on whether or not it is truly their last album. And I'm going to go with Queen's Innuendo. And I think Alan's going to come in with the other option after this. So I would consider Innuendo to be the final album simply because it was the one that was made with all four of them together. To me, that's just kind of a more cohesive structure than coming back at the end with kind of pre-recorded vocals and building the album around them. I think Innuendo is just a phenomenal album. I mean, the title track, which it kicks off with, to me, is designed to be a Bohemian Rhapsody for the 90s, going through multiple sections. It's a masterpiece. And then you have all these emotions that are clearly coming out through Freddie knowing that he's on the way out with songs like I'm Going Slightly Mad, mm. These Are The Days Of Our Lives, The Show Must Go On. Yeah, You can hear that emotion, and yet you still have those kind of hard rock influences that Queen absolutely are known for, like Headlong. It's a really solid album and one that I love so much. And I love that Roger Taylor gave us a kind of sequel to I'm in love with my car with Bright the Wild Wind. Right. <laughs> it's something no one asked for, but it's still great. <laughs> it's just, to me, it's just such a charming album. Um, it, it really feels cohesive and I just love it. I do too. I'm with you. Innuendo, I think you're absolutely right, is the next generation of Bohemian Rhapsody. I think it's a stellar album. The flamenco guitar in it is just spectacular. In 5-4, I should say. In 5-4. Yeah, it's so great. And I think everything about that track is just amazing and epic. Headlong, spectacular song. Ride the Wild Wind, I'm going to say. Yeah, it's, I mean, you know, it's the drummer who wrote it and sang it, so I'm going to be all on board with it but the rest of it is so it's such a like the bowie album i mean it's a gut punch and yes i was planning on talking about made in heaven because it was the last ditch effort to make a queen album and to do it with freddie and they basically were in the studio they basically lived in the studio for a while and freddie would call and say hey i think i'm feeling up to doing a couple of hours i'm going to be there in a little bit and he told brian he said write whatever you can write just write me some stuff to sing and i'll sing as much as i can i will give you as much material as i possibly can and i just feel like for Talk about being your deathbed. He absolutely was. And it was this true race against time. Yeah, it's not as cohesive an album as Innuendo. I totally agree with that. And there is a sort of cobbled together nature in it. But at the same time, I feel like the angst of the situation comes through in it. I don't think maybe it does in the same way that it does in songs like The Show Must Go On, because that's just... That song gets me every single time I hear it, but I find made in heaven. I mean, okay. It's not one of the greatest queen album, but you know, and, and by the way, I just want to say we're recording this on 10 22 tomorrow night. I'm going to be seeing queen. Oh my gosh. I forgot about that. That's I'm awesome. So excited. I hope you don't have tickets because you forgot about the show. 
I do not have tickets. I think we're agreed on one thing here, Alan, and that's the Cosmos Rocks doesn't count. Oh, 100%. 100%. There's also an interesting parallel. You're talking about Freddie being on his deathbed. Uh, While it wasn't AIDS and they weren't recording an album, Dio worked for as long as he could as well. I've read stories of those final shows he did with Heaven and Hell yeah where he would be doubled over in pain before the show and straight afterwards but he'd take a deep breath get out there sing like no one would know anything was wrong with him do his job and then get off and be doubled you know yeah, yeah. In an enormous amount of pain yeah. that level of professionalism to me is amazing absolutely that is absolute commitment not only to your craft to your bandmates to your career yes. to your fans Oh my God. I mean, but you're right. I heard those stories too. Like I I'm sure I heard that there was coughing up of blood at some point and that's Ronnie committed to what he does. And God, man, I just can't even imagine. And Freddie was the same. Committed was the to same. what they did. Yeah. Music was their life. The, they felt a strong affinity for their fans and they wanted to do what they did best. Absolutely. Amazing people. Yes. Better than me. <laughs> that's good that's gonna be me though like i'm gonna be on my deathbed and i'll be recording one last episode of modern musicology <laughs> <laughs> so since steph isn't here i'll chime in with one for her that she may have picked and if i'm wrong she can slap me in the face but fourth is the last and final album from the verve in 2008 uh, the thing that's interesting with it is it it I think it hit number one in the UK charts. It did really, really well. It had really great songwriting from Ashcroft on it, and it had some really great production. And it sounded like, you know, a band that was firing on all cylinders, but it's their last record. So I'll go with that one. I, I just think Steph might pick that one if she were here, knowing how big of a fan of the Verve she were. And it's also a record that kind of gets lost in the times of the whole Britpop thing. It kind of gets lost in the shuffle a little bit. Yeah. It's a shame that band just fucking hated each other by the end of it. Mm -hmm. Honestly, I'd forgotten they did a, a final album. I, yeah. I keep thinking Urban Hymns was it, but no, they came back 11 years later. That's right. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I think that's that's a band that just should never have reformed. I mean, they really did kind of hate each other by the end, which shame. It's funny how often that happens, too. Because I have one on my list that I was going to pick in Stephanie's stead, because knowing that she's not here, I know she would have picked the police synchronicity. And you talk about people that hated each other by the end of their career. Holy cow. Like they got in fistfights in the studio and the producer was going to quit halfway through the job because he couldn't stand it anymore. But that's a great album. And it's basically got two title tracks. It's got this string of huge hits. Every breath you take King of pain wrapped around your finger. And I like those. Okay. But some of the deeper tracks walking in your footsteps. Oh my God is a great song. And then Andy's weird, weird, weird song mother, which is just insane. And Stewart's Ms. Gradenko. I absolutely love. So I know that she would have picked that one. And I wanted, I was going to represent Miss Stephanie with synchronicity. Anthony, what's next on your list? All right. Another one where it's not technically the last album, but frankly, The Endless River doesn't count. So we're going <laughs> with Pink Floyd with The Division Bell. I mean, the, the Endless River was just cobbled together with samples from offcuts from The Division Bell sessions anyway, just right. to commercialize on them. So it doesn't count. The Division Bell was the final Pink Floyd album, and it's just spectacular. You know, I feel like a lot of people often put the post-Waters era of pink floyd down yeah but i think if you're one of those people give the division bell a chance it's oh so many elements of that just send shivers down my spine whether it's the start with cluster one what do you want from me keep talking i think yeah. is just spectacular and is just this wonderful piece that sums up my thoughts our biggest problems in in society are because we don't talk to each other and we don't listen to each other anymore and that was what pink floyd was saying in you know 1994 yeah and we're still seeing that 19 19 however many years later it is nearly 30 years later <laughs> christ i'm getting old 
And then that final track, High Hopes. Oh, yes. Shivers. Yes. Shivers. It's a great, great album. And then there was that whole nonsense thing around it with the Publius Enigma, which still fascinates me to this day. I really wish we'd found out what that was all about. I, I think that's just such an interesting concept. And I don't know if the band were ever truly clued into that hmm. or if that was the, just the label. But Either way, some guerrilla marketing there that I really enjoyed. Yeah. I just think that's a phenomenal album. I'm with you on that one. I would say more, please, but then you get The Endless River and I'm good. <laughs> Thanks. Right. We got more, please, and that's what we got. <laughs> I want a prop I wanted a proper final Pink Floyd album, which will now never happen, but Right. You know. It is the division bell. We're done. Right. Right. All right. So okay, I'm gonna hit the B-52s, because that is a band that you don't think of in terms of great albums or anything like that. Um, even though a lot of their albums are really fun, solid records that hold together really well. The last album that they had done was 92, and that was good stuff. So in 2008, they came back with one more album, and it was all like self-funded, self-released, all this kind of stuff. And it was called Funplex, and it is a fantastic album. I think it's one of the best albums of B-52s ever released. Hot Corner, Ultraviolet, Juliet of the Spirits. I mean, it's just a great record. I was in a band at the time, and we were going to be doing a, a show featuring some of the sort of Atlanta area, area, like extended Atlanta area bands. And we did, um, we had two uh, girl singers. We opened with Indigo Girls. We did like five or six Indigo Girls tracks. And then we did five or six REM tracks. And then we did seven, I think seven or eight B-52s tracks. And I had gotten a hold. I don't even know where this came from. I don't know how I got it, but I got a hold of a, a demo of the first single from Funplex, which was the title song. And we played that song and we were like, okay, you want to hear a B-52 song that you've never heard before because it's never been released? Well, we're going to play it for you. And it was the, the title song from the upcoming album. And man, it was very different in its demo form, but, and the copy that I got was horrible and it was hard to understand what they were saying and all this kind of stuff, but we cobbled it together as well as we could. And we got to play a B-52 song before anybody else in the world had ever heard it before. <laughs> but man, it's a great album. I absolutely, I, I think it's like in the upper echelon, it's like of their full catalog, there's four completely indispensable albums and Funplex is one of those. I also would urge you, if you would like to go back to the vast archive of resource material from our podcast, you could listen to our interview with Tommy Stinson, yes. uh, which leads me to this. It's Tommy Stinson adjacent, all shook down by the replacements. Mm. Originally planned on being the very first Paul Westerberg solo album, but the label said, no, 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 make it a replacements album. So he got John Cale to be on it. He got uh, Jeanette N Napolitano from Concrete Blonde to be on it. Um, they went through, this is, this is where if Steph were here, we would have half of the drummers that, uh, amount of drummers that were on the replacements record. They had four different drummers on that record, <laughs> four drummers on all, on all shook down. Hard to believe at the same time. No, no, no. Then it would be amazing. a Paul Simon record, <laughs> right? <laughs> The replacements, you know, it's, it's, they're all on it. They're just on it in various times and shades. And the band has been very coy. Even I think Tommy was to a certain extent when he talked about it with us about who did what on the record. It's still not really known. It's just kind of written up as being a replacements record. It is an okay way to go out. I mean, there are some hits on it and things, but it very much upon hindsight sort of does sound like a Paul Westerberg and his friends album kind of. And it does sound like, you know, if, if we ever did a podcast on like great uh, last albums that never should have been made, that's kind of it. It just sounded like a band that clearly was just either filling out a deal or checking in or just wasn't really invested or just had lost it. Right. I know we talked about the verb and how much they all hated each other, but that album near the end, you could hear the animosity, I think, on, on some of the songs. And um, it's just very sad. The last one I've got. And again, there were some posthumous albums here. So you might not say that this was this artist's final album if you want to nitpick, but 
to give you a hint of where I'm going, this was this artist's 67th album. Holy cow. And that's Johnny Cash with American 4, The Man Comes Around. I was thinking about this earlier today, and yeah, good point. Now, more covers than original material, but man, those final recordings. That Nick Cave cover is amazing. Yeah, they they hit hard. I mean, I know the the big big track from that was his cover of Nine Inch Nails' "Hurt." Yeah, which in itself, did you ever think you would hear Johnny Cash covering Trent Reznor? That sentence in itself is a little ridiculous. Did you ever think that Johnny Cash would even know who Nine Inch Nails is? <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> but there's, there's a- something about that that pair up that just is. Oh man, it's just a stab in the heart. Yeah, and Ruben brought him the songs as lyrics before he brought them what they sounded like, which was probably very smart. Yeah. Yeah. But ooh, that that hits hard that track. It still does. His cover of Personal Jesus. Mhm. Mhm. <sighs> yeah. I don't know. I might actually like that better than the original and I love the original. Yeah. In my life, amazing bridge over troubled water I, just mm. from start to finish it it's it's really touching the the song selection is great the amount of physical pain he was in making that record i know we talked about freddie mercury but he was pretty much coming in between being doped up on painkillers to, to kill the, the pain of what he was going through right medical medically prescribed real legitimate ones this time and doing what he could and then just calling it a day i mean it, it was done in literal dribs and drabs and Literally every song on there is just phenomenal. And, you know, you hear the stories of like Trent Reznor's like, yeah, somebody from Johnny Cash wants to talk to you about clearance and license. (laughs) (laughs) You're like, wait a minute, what? You know, Nick Cave talks about like um, he got a phone call from Johnny Cash saying, I really loved your song. And he's like, "Okay, I'm done. Right. I don't need to do anything else ever again. Right. Yeah, really. Like everyone who had their song covered felt really privileged. And it was sort of a reciprocated love. It was him covering songs and making songs that touched a nerve with him that were done by other people. But at the same time, all these people who wrote these songs were like, you could feel the, the love going back to him. And it's, it's a profound way to go because it's so emotionally layered. We talked about Black Star, where you know you're hearing a guy near the end, but this is somebody that's clearly at the end of their life looking back at what they did. And he's not afraid to sing about his mistakes and his regrets through other people's songs. And that's really, Mm. really hard to do. And I think that's the beauty of it. The thing I think's wild about it was he was only 71 when he died. You know, my dad's 77. Yeah. You know, that's, to me, that's crazy. I, uh, until I read that earlier today, when I was researching for this, I had thought he was 10 years older than that. You know, I thought he was in his 80s. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, Time really disappears. But, you know, I think it, it's an instance of June died four months before he did and he just couldn't go on without her. You know, that really was the final blow for him. Um, but I'm glad we, we got that final recording and, and then the very last recordings that he was making literally a month before he died on his posthumous albums, just amazing artist and what a way to go out. All right. Well, that sounds like a good place to cut it. We are going to be right back in 30 seconds and we're going to do our picks of the week. So stick around. Hi, this is Jim Adams from Monster Attack, inviting you to join us every Monday night at five o'clock for an all new episode of Monster Attack. For the last seven years, we've been talking about these wonderful movies that we grew up with as monster kids so join us every monday at 5 p.m right here on the eso network all right here we are picks of the week it is that time who wants to kick it off i nominate rob okay sounds good rob hit it oh uh okay uh i'm gonna start with a book because there's one thing that alan and i need is more books on music right well and that's the truth so 
Yeah. Uh, Will Hermes, who wrote a fantastic book on, on New York in the 70s, has a new book out called Lou Reed, King of New York, that if you are even mildly into Lou Reed, it's really interesting. It's really great. Stuff on Bowie in there is great. The stuff on Iggy is great. The stuff about the Velvet Underground is really interesting. And the dynamic of him growing up in, this, you know, he grew up in the suburbs. You know, he didn't grow up on the mean streets of a particular place, right? He kind of had a fairly well childhood. And then it gets to when he's in college, he just kind of like breaks away. It's an interesting story about an artist that we don't always think about in terms of their legacy, because the people that made records the same time as he did left a lot bigger legacies. <laughs> but it's a really interesting new examination of Lou Reed, and I recommend it. Also, Idols have a new record out. They dropped a single from it this hmm. week called Dancer. It's got James Murphy and um, what's her name? Uh, the, James Murphy, the other woman from um, LCD Sound System are on it. So it's a little different sort of sound. They just wanted to make a record that wasn't all, you know, anger and rage this time around. Uh, so that's the first single from the album Tank, spelt weird, which comes out next year. And then I'm a big fan of Lush. I love that band. And Emma Anderson has slowly been releasing singles one at a time thing we now call the gabriel plan but she's released a new single called the presence and it's really catchy it's really great if you like lush you like that those two and then uh alan were you going to mention the reds pinks and purples or do you want me to talk about it no you go right ahead so there's a brand new uh it's a new week so again a new week means of course there's a new record from the reds pinks and purples uh this one is murder oral sex and cigarettes glenn donaldson just has a voice unlike anybody else and he basically just makes records faster than Alan makes podcasts. And um, it's really, really, really good. So if you like sort of like pop, or if you're a fan of a fan of somebody who liked like the Smiths, but you don't want to have to deal with Morrissey, the reds, pinks, and purples are kind of the heir apparent in terms of m melody and the lyrical wit and the sublimeness of, of the song. So all of those. Um, and the, the Souls Mining uh, turns 40 this week, which is a fantastic record as well. So that's it for me. All right. I honestly don't remember what I mentioned last week, so there might be some repeats here. Um, Judas Priest dropped a new track, Panic Attack, that sounds like Judas Priest. Yes, it does. It, yeah. it's, it's good, but I wouldn't say there's anything groundbreaking in that, aside from it's a bit synth heavier than anything they've done really since Turbo. So that's kind of enjoyable. I know I mentioned last week that I was on a huge kill switch engage. What's the word I'm looking for? Kind of spree. And I still am, uh, but that's led me to delve into some tracks that I'm not so familiar with. Previously, I'd really focused on certain albums and I've been discovering some of the stuff I wasn't really listening to before. So what I love about Kill Switch Engage is they're a pretty heavy band, but a lot of their tracks are very, um, they have very, very positive messages. You know, they're about coping with depression or I, I don't want to say positive, I guess, uh, sentimental um messages you know they, they had a lot when their previous singer was dealing with the death of his mother a lot of tracks about how much he missed her which when you think about it is kind of screamed <laughs> which <Yeah. laughs> really adds a, a very interesting uh element to it but there's there's a track on one of their album more recent albums called hate by design that's all about how certain elements of society just like to stir up hate and how we need to rise above that and be better that's really been going around in my head lately and i think says a lot about society as it is today and then last but not least dragon force my favorite power metalers dropped a new track this week called the power of the triforce which is about the legend of zelda of all things <laughs> it's amazing it's the kind of cheesy power metal that you expect from dragon force and i absolutely love it and then one other thing i think uh maybe last year maybe the year before billy idol dropped an ep called the roadside and it starts off with a track called rita hayworth that is just so fun <laughs> really really love that track and it's been getting a lot of rotation from me this week and on that note alan i will hand over to you because you do not look like rita hayworth <laughs> Well, just a note for the listener, when they hear this episode, when Anthony talks about things that he mentioned last week, we're recording out of order. So oh. the ones that he <laughs> mentioned, having talked about last week, you will hear next week. So, but I don't think there's any, I don't think you mentioned Dragon Force. So I don't think there's any, any 
crossover. So it'll all cool. be new stuff. Um, and I just don't really have anything this week. It was an off week for me. I have been so focused on work and some other stuff that I just haven't listened to as much. Now, the one thing that I did do was uh, to comb through one of the streaming services. Which one was it? Um, oh, it was Canopy, the one that you can get free with your library card. If you have a card with a county that or state or whatever that subscribes to Canopy, you have access to it. And I just went through and put a whole crap ton of music documentaries on my watch list. So that is the fodder for future picks of the week, but I don't have anything for this week. Next week is our Halloween episode. So we are going to be talking about the band Ghost, which is one of Anthony's favorite bands. It's a band that Anthony introduced to me, and we have a very special guest that's going to be joining us to talk about that. And then two weeks from now, we will have, I believe, hopefully we'll have all four of the gang together, hopefully. And we're going to be talking about the great producers. So stick around for those episodes. We will see you very soon. And I want to leave you with this. And in the end, the love you take is equal to the love you make. Keep rocking on. And we'll see you next time. This has been a broadcast of the ESO Network. Be part of the crew and help support our shows by donating to our ESO Patreon or by shopping for the T Public Store, which can all be found at www.esonetwork.com. The ESO Network. Your station for all things geek.